All right, well, welcome everybody. This is uh, this is lesson twelve. So we're we're start we're getting ready to round the curve for uh, head for home. We got three more after tonight. He says that. We'll finish. We'll finish. We'll finish May the first. We'll finish May the first. Um, so just to kind of tie us into where we're at here, um, these last three weeks, um, he's talked about preachers talked about um, there's certain things God's wisdom can't tell us in life, right? Can't tell us when we're going to die, can't ensure that there's going to be justice in this world, uh, that sort of thing. But tonight, he's going to be talking specifically about applying God's word in this topsy-turvy world. In the last three weeks now, he's... Uh, uh, in uh, Lesson 10, we talked about how God's providences are inscrutable. And then we talked about the rat race and talked about the, the need for balance, the need to live with balance in this world. And tonight, he's going to be talking about uncertainty. Right? If, if there's a hallmark of this, un, of this absurd and vain world we've been studying the last several weeks, it's uncertain. We're not in control. We can't predict necessarily what tomorrow's going to bring. And so he's going to talk about living sensibly. Um, two of the commentaries I read, uh, you know, really, really uh, highlighted this word. Using God's word to live sensibly in a world that's not very predictable. And so we're going to talk tonight about foolishness, which is the playing out of this vanity and absurdity in the world and and how we can mitigate risk using God's word. So that's kind of the upshot for tonight. And he's, uh, there's some, I, I, I told you last week that he's starting to use a lot of the Proverbs. He's referring back to Proverbs that, you know, that we'd see in the book of Proverbs. And he's going to use some more of those Proverbs tonight. And uh, I hope you enjoy some of them. Some of them are really good. Gracious Lord, we praise you tonight for your good word. We thank you that you are certain and you are sovereign, even though this world that we live in is not certain and it's absurd and it's vain and it's frustrating. But we thank you, Lord, that you are with us to help us navigate through this, that your word guides us, that your word gives us wise counsel to, to deal with this unpredictability. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to be with us and your faithfulness in your word tonight. Help us to hear and listen and to obey you as you show us your truth. Amen. Amen. All right. So um, did you know yesterday everything that was going to happen today, everything you had to deal with today? Any ringers? Get any, any ringers pop up today? Surprises? I see a few heads, okay. Did you know a year ago what you'd be dealing with today? All right, very, very unpredictable, right? Uh, well, we've, we've talked about this uh, several times along the way. Uh, the vanity in the world is directly related to the madness that comes with sin and rebellion against the Creator. And uh, flip back to Ecclesiastes 1. This was kind of uh, in one of the first two lessons. And that uh, the idea where he introduced the idea of, of futility in the creation, in the cycles. The generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. Also, the sun sets and the sun rises. Um, and he gets over to verse 8, all things are wearisome, man's not able to tell it. In other words, we can't predict it or understand it. Um, well, he's talked about this theme all through the book, this, this vanity, this madness of sin, and all the, the, the uh, vanity that creates. And so this chapter 10, he's going to talk about, again, using Proverbs, and to, he's going to hammer again on this point that we're not in control and we can't even tell what's coming tomorrow. 
And, you know, shame on us if we think we're in control of our life and that we know what's going to happen, etc. right? Haven't we all been surprised in big ways along the way? Well, he's going to hammer on this tonight and remind us that this foolishness, this unpredictability is in, is in everywhere, it's, it's in everything, it's just uni universal in this uh, living under the sun. There's, it, it just infects everything. And then we're going to break the second half of the lesson. We're going to talk about, okay, given that, what are some things that you can do to live sensibly, to manage risk, to live in the fear of the Lord, and to deal with these things that are, that are so uncertain and so unpredictable? Um, so wisdom, he's talked about the limitations of, of wisdom, you know, of the wisdom writings in Scripture. It can't explain a lot of things for us. It can't predict exactly what's going to happen, but it is useful. He's going to talk about the use, utility of God's word tonight to help us deal, to live life in the fear of the Lord and to deal with some of these, these risk issues. So that's kind of the warm up here. So sensible living here. Now, one of the, the tone of this book, I mentioned again back in the introduction, some people think this book or parts of this book were written to train people who were going to be royal service. They were going to, to train officials, to train uh, people to lead in the government. And you're going, to, you're going to hear a little of that bent tonight about how to deal with um, uh, when issues pop up, how do you deal with them? How do you, how, uh, how do you, how do you deal with uncertainty in, in the sense of uh, being a leader or being a, an official and that sort of thing. It's got a little bit of that tone as, as we read this tonight. So um, <clears throat> let's, let's read now Ecclesiastes 10, and we'll go uh, verses 1 to 7. And there's some great Proverbs here. All right, here's how he starts off. Dead flies make a perfumer's oil stink. <laughs> <laughs> so a little, a little foolishness is weightier than wisdom and honor. Okay, here's another one. A wise man's heart directs him toward the right, but the foolish man's heart directs him toward the left. Verse three, even when the fool walks along the road, his sense is lacking and he demonstrates to everyone that he's a fool. Verse four, if a ruler's temper rises against you, do not abandon your position because composure allays great offenses. Verse five, there's an evil I've seen under the sun, like an heir which goes forth from the ruler. Folly is set in many exalted places while rich men sit in humble places. I have seen slaves riding on horses and princes walking on, like slaves on the land. Okay, these all sound kind of like they're disjointed here, but, but I think we're going to be able to see that it, there's a bigger theme that runs through all these. In the, in the, how is a fool defined in Scripture? Okay, okay, flip. Keep your finger in Ecclesiastes and flip over to Psalm 14. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have a committed abominable deeds. There's no one who does good. Okay, so this vanity, you know, we, we talked about a couple lessons back. The ultimate vanity is the creature being in rebellion against the creator who made him. Right, And that's the condition of this vain world, in this sinful rebellion against the Creator. So the fool is the one that says, there's no God. I'm going to live like there is no God. That's life under the sun, like he's been talking to us about all these weeks. Life under the sun, I'm going to live like there is no God, like I'm not going to be accountable. There's, nothing, there's no judgment after death. I'm just going to live like there's no God. Okay, that's the context now that the preacher is going to be using when he's talking about fool. That's, that's what he's talking about here. A lot of this, this chapter is directly back to Proverbs and Psalms. And I'll show you where the, 
how he's, he's kind of referring to some of these proverbs as it goes here. Okay, so now we know about what a fool is. All right, let's talk about dead flies, verse 1. <laughs> what in the world is he talking about? Dead flies make a perfumer's oil stink. Isn't that the That's the right place? idea. That's okay. the right idea. It only takes a little sin to pollute a person's character. Dead flies. It only takes a couple of stinking flies to ruin a bunch of, of uh, perfume. So a little foolishness is weightier than wisdom and honor. So what we're getting at here, this foolishness is going to be everywhere, and it's very potent. Bad decisions can go a long way. Foolishness can destroy persons and families and nations. Right? Dead. So dead flies make a perfumer's oil stink. A little scent and little leaven leavens the whole loaf. That's the idea here. So he's saying this a little bit of foolishness is very potent. It goes a long, long ways here. Um <clears throat> All right, now let's look at verse two. A wise, man hearts, a wise man's heart directs him toward the right, but the foolish man's heart directs him toward the left. So what he's getting at here is foolishness, this rebellion against God, is, can, is directly opposed to the way of wisdom. All right, this goes back to what we just saw in, in the Psalm 14. So God's ways are this way, is this direction, but the foolish man chooses the opposite direction. So you get this idea of, of vanity and of foolishness. It's opposed to God's direction. It's opposed to God's will. Um, now remember what Jesus said in Matthew 7, at the end of the, of the uh, uh, Sermon on the Mount, he gave the illustration of, of the idea of the man who was going to build his house on the sand and the one who was going to build his house on the rock. Let me get you there. Uh, Matthew 7, 24. <laughs> and this idea, this, the Bible does this a lot. Right? There's God's way and there's this way. And there's no, there's no basic compromise. It's one or the other. And the rain does say, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. So there's the right, if you will, back to the uh, Ecclesiastes verse. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and burst against that house, yet it did not fall, for it had been founded upon the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them will be like a foolish man, just like the preacher's talking about, who built his house upon the sand and the rains descended and the floods came and the wind blew and burst against that house and it fell and great was its fall. Right? So Jesus you know, basically illustrates the same thing here. So what the preacher's saying back in verse 2 here, 10-2, wise man hearts direct him toward the right, God's direction, the foolish man's heart directs him toward the left. Foolishness takes you away, uh, opposes God's, God's uh, will and purposes here. Look at verse 3. All right. Have you, ever, have you ever seen a fool? You ever seen a fool in action? Okay. Even when the fool walks along the road, his sense is lacking, and he demonstrates to everyone that he's a fool. Right? There's some types of foolishness or sin against God that you can't hide. So he says, even, the, even a fool trying to walk alongside the road, it's obvious to everybody around him that he's a fool Maybe by the way he's acting. The other scary part of this is that, like with this verse saying, and even though people see it and, and they know he's a fool, they don't call him out on it. He's left a lot, right? We see this in, a lot of times people do some pretty crazy stuff and take some pretty crazy positions 
and nobody necessarily calls them out on it. It's like that, like the, the king that when he had no clothes on. Yeah. <laughs> and nobody that idea. Yeah. The same thing. Exactly. Exactly. So, so another aspect here of foolishness that it's frequently obvious, but it isn't necessarily rebuked. Proverbs 13, 16. Kind of gets at this. I'm going to keep trying to tie you back to Proverbs so you see the parallel here. Every prudent man, okay, he's, the preacher talked about the foolish man. Every prudent man acts with knowledge, but a fool displays folly. A fool displays folly. So foolishness can be very obvious, but it isn't, doesn't mean necessarily that anybody's going to try to correct it. All right. Now, here's, here's a, a little counsel here, verse 4. If the ruler's temper rises against you, do not abandon your position because composure allays great offenses. <clears throat> Have you been in a situation where everybody lost their head? <clears throat> You've been in a conversation where something happened and everybody around you just lost their head. Nobody, nobody's ever had a situation like that. And cooler heads prevail, isn't that? That's the hope. That's the hope. Uh, oh, yeah, I've, I've been in a lot of situations like this at work. Um, <laughs> if the ruler's temper rises against you, do not abandon your position because composure allays great offenses. You don't necessarily know when the boss is going to get upset or what he's going to get upset about. You don't necessarily know if there's going to be some kind of catastrophe that comes up in a church, in a family, in a business, whatever. Right? <laughs> foolishness, foolishness overreacts. That's what he's pointing out. Foolishness overreacts. The wise man, the wise man does not abandon his position. He doesn't lose his head because composure allays great offenses. So foolishness tends to, what he's saying is foolishness tends to overreact. The sky is falling. Everything's because climate change. Haven't you heard that this week? Even people were saying, well, the earthquake in New Jersey was because of climate change. Maybe not. <laughs> okay. So was the eclipse. The eclipse was, the eclipse, uh, was because of climate change. Yeah, right. But so, so those are overreactions, right? Foolishness tends to overreact. That's what the verse is saying here. That's what the verse is saying. So we're counseled to keep our heads. Uh, verse Proverbs 25, 15, I won't chase it for you, but it talks about don't react to a fool. It's, a, it's, the, it's the wise counsel. Don't overreact. Um, now, the other thing is foolishness can go everywhere. Vanity goes everywhere. It can't be. It can't be contained. It's not limited by geography. It's not limited by status. It's not limited uh, in any part of society. And the scary thing is, it goes into our governments. Verses five to seven. Now, this there is an evil I have seen under the sun, like an heir from which goes forth from the ruler. Remember, Solomon's a king, supposedly, right? The preacher's persona is Solomon. So listen to what he says. Like an heir which goes forth from the ruler, folly is set in many exalted places while rich men sit in humble places. I've seen slaves riding on horses and princes walking like slaves on the land. So there's a couple things going on here. One, foolishness gets into our governments and folly it can change the incumbent order. That's why he says that rich men sit in humble places. So the guys who, rich men, it implies education, it implies uh, influence. Okay, so the foolishness flips things around so that the best leaders aren't the ones leading. Mm -hmm. That's what he's pointing out here. I've seen slaves riding on horses and princes walking like slaves on the land, upside down. Foolishness flips things upside down. The people who should be listening are the ones talking. 
All right? Isn't that scary? So at the time when at the time when you, you you know you got a crisis or something going on, you got the wrong people leading the the, the response, right? Are we talking about the White House? No, <laughs> well, actually today. Any, you know, you know, this isn't limited to our, to our times. You know, any, any history readers out there, this certainly is not limited to our times. It will be. It was before us. It's in our time. And it'll be there for our kids and our grandkids' times, right? But the, the point here is this foolishness, this rebellion against God and the absurdity that all goes with it is everywhere. All the time. It's pervasive. This is life on, this is the description of life under the sun. Last week he told us it was madness. It was madness and insanity. Well, here's how it plays out in this foolishness. In this, everything's being juxtaposed, upside down, wrong direction from God. Little bits of it go a long, long way. Right? Scary. Scary. So the good news, Miss Sadie, the good news is, I told you this is going to be uplifting tonight. So the good news here... <laughs> The good, the good news here is that God's wisdom is countercultural. The good news is that God's wisdom can help us deal with this and, and, and live in the fear of the Lord. I want you to flip over to 1 Corinthians uh, 1. Paul, Paul talks about this when he's writing the Corinthians. And they had a lot of issues going on in church Corinth. And this is one of the first things that he tells them. This, uh, so 1 Corinthians, I'll just read 27 to 29. But God has chosen the, fool, the, thing, the foolish things of the world, the things that are foolish to the world, to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, and things that are not, that he might nullify the things that are, that no man should boast before God. So living in the fear of the Lord, and we've talked about it through the weeks, living in pleasure and in faith in the day, in the middle of this absolute world, is going to be countercultural. And exercising godly wisdom is going to be counter countercultural in this whole world where foolishness is just a wash. Okay? No surprise here, right? No surprise. Preacher just kind of laying it out um, very graphically with these with these proverbs. So let's he's got some more graphic ones for you tonight. So life is uncertain. That's kind of a given. So wisdom, godly wisdom, can help us mitigate risk. So we're going to start in verse 8. We'll read 20. These are, these are some great ones here. He who digs a pit may fall into it, and a serpent may bite him who breaks through a wall. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hang on, hang on. They... they he who quarries stones may be hurt by them, and he who splits logs may be endangered by them. Verse 10, if the axe is dull, he does not sharpen his, its edge, then he must exert more strength. Wisdom, this is kind of the upshot of the lesson tonight, wisdom has the advantage of giving success. Here's a great one. If the serpent bites before being charmed, there's no profit for the charmer. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> words, words from the mouth of a wise man are gracious, while the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of his talking is folly, and the end of it is wicked madness. Verse 14. Yet the fool multiplies words. No man knows what will happen, and who can tell him what will come after him? Verse 15, the toil of a fool so wearies him that he does not even know how to go to a city. 
Woe to you, O land, whose king is a lad and whose princes feast in the morning. Blessed are you, O land, whose king is of nobility and whose princes eat at the appropriate time for strength and not for drunkenness. Through indolence, the rafters sag and through slackness, the house leaks. Men prepare a meal for enjoyment and wine makes life merry and money is the answer to everything. Hold on to that and we're going to talk a lot about that. Amen. Furthermore, in your bedchamber, do not curse a king, and in your sleeping rooms, do not curse a rich man, for the bird of the heavens will carry, a bird of the heavens will carry the sound, and the winged creature will make the matter known. Okay, so you got a lot of things going on here. And, and we're not used to these, right? We don't talk with Proverbs. We don't grow up studying Proverbs or anything. But in the ancient times, this was a, this was a, a standard, regular way to teach lessons. And these are very memorable, right? The, the, these word pictures are very memorable. So we'll, we'll talk about what they mean now. All right, verse 8. Okay, so we've talked about this, that foolishness and unpredictability are everywhere. Okay? There's some things that you can see. There's some risk that you can see. And there's some risk that you can't see. Right? You can see some problems coming, but there's other things that just sort of pop out of the air, right? So that's what he's talking about, verse 8. He who digs a pit, okay, I dig the pit, I know where the pit's at, I can see the pit, but I can still fall into it. So there's some risk that I can see. I can see, I, 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 can, vis I can see it, I know it's there, I know what the nature of the risk is. But there's other things. A serpent may bite him who breaks through a wall. I don't know if you've ever done any house remodeling or uh, demolo de demolishing anything, but when you break through the wall, you don't know what's in the wall. You don't know what's behind the wall, right? So hopefully not a snake. But see, that's the power of these proverbs. They're very graphic, very visual. So, but that's what he's saying here. There's some things that you can see. There's some risk in life you can see. And you, right, you can prepare yourself for it. There's other things you can't see. And you don't know what's going to happen when you pop through that wall and what's behind that wall. Right? Any, any, anything surprise you in life when you, you took a step or did something and poof, there was another set of problems that popped out of nowhere? Nobody had gotten surprised. Okay. <laughs> Happens all the time. Yeah. Right, building a house. Building a house. There you go. There you go. One thing kind of leads to another, and you can't always see them come. Oh, by the way, particularly if you're remodeling a house, like mm -hmm. you watch these house programs, oh, yeah. right? Oh, well, oh, look, the we thought it was just a roof problem, and now the plumbing shot and the elect electrical <laughs> shot, et cetera, et cetera, right? right. You don't know what's going to happen when you pop through the wall, what kind of a snake is going to be there, right? But there's other things, right? You think of the house, you know, they usually, when they walk up the house, we know that this is a problem and that's a problem. That's what he's talking about, the pit. I can see that problem. I can deal with that. So the idea here is that you've got to prepare yourself for things you can see. And you've got to have some level of preparation for the things you can't see in life. Because of this unpredictability of life. Um, there's a guy I went to uh, undergrad school with. Uh, he got out, took his job, and um, he had just he'd very recently become a believer. And he had, um, but he took a position that because I'm going to walk in faith and I'm not going to buy insurance. Okay? Because he was going to trust God. Okay? But the other way to think about that, God provides insurance. <laughs> because you don't know what's going to happen when you put your hand through the wall or what's behind the wall, these unpredictable risk and everything, okay? But that's what insurance is about. We're, it's, a man, it's a way to manage unpredictable risk. So that's what he's coaching us on here tonight. you got to recognize there's some risk that you can see and there's something you can't see and you can't know when they're coming, okay? So that's what that proverb's about. 
Um, all right. Verse uh, 9 then. You ever gotten hurt when you were doing a job around the house? Hurt more your fingers? More accidents, hurt your... Happen at home. more accidents happen at home, right? Yeah. That's why we shouldn't do it. <laughs> that's 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 next week's lesson. That, that's that's next week's lesson. Take, that's managing risk. We're going to talk about taking risk next week. Okay. All right. So verse nine: He who quarries stones may be hurt by them. He who splits logs may be endangered by them. What's that mean? These guys are professionals. One guy cuts stones, one guy cuts wood. There's risk there in every risk life. life. There's risk everywhere, right? He's, he's saying this again, okay? Inherent risk. Inherent risk, right? Handling big rocks at a quarry has inherent risk. Cutting a tree down has inherent risk in it. Driving a car down the highway. Driving a car down the highway, right? Right? Exactly. So that's what he's saying here. You got to. This is realizing you can't. You you cannot be in a risk-free environment. And that's, so you can't say, "Why me?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's just out there. Yeah, but this is this is the world that we live in in this vanity. So you got to realize that everything has a certain risk with it. There's nothing that's going to be risk-free, and that's the first. That's the you know, the, like the first light that's got to go on to live sensibly is realize that there's nothing we, there's nothing, you can't eliminate risk, right? And, you know, you can get into all kinds of discussion about cost versus return curves and all this kind of stuff. But no matter to what extent you go to, you can't completely eliminate risk, right? All right. Um, uh, verse 11, this is a great one. If a serpent bites before being charmed, there's no profit for the charmer. What's that mean? Not <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. The charmer might be dead. Well, he's saying if. He, go ahead, Mary. That's if the charmer's not going to get saved. That's right. If it, if it didn't work, if the snake doesn't do his thing and he's sick, yeah, yeah. So he's saying, don't, you know, there's, if you don't take precautions for risks that you can see, that's a problem. Right? You know, the snake, uh, listen, I were in Morocco and we were in Mar Marrakesh. And so they've got snake charmers out there in the middle of the plaza and they're doing, you know, they're doing the little thing and the snakes are. <laughs> And so they, and she didn't want to look at it. I thought it was funny. So this guy had, this guy had probably about a half dozen snakes out there, you know. And uh, he wanted to still wear them. Oh. Well, I wasn't going for that. But, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, the the point he's saying uh, with um, the snake here, verse eleven, uh, if if you know there's risk and you fail to take appropriate precautions, you could pay a heavy price for it, right? So if you, do, if you go into something and you know that there's a problem, an obvious risk or a problem or something, and you don't, that's, it's unwise to, to not take the appropriate precautions here. So think about that, you, you two snake charming going on there. All right. Now, one of the biggest sources of our risk, we think about our world being vain. What about our tongue? Our tongue can get ourselves in a whole heap of trouble in a hurry. So what he's saying, his counsel here is another thing you have to manage with risk is managing your tongue. And this is a, this is a theme all through scripture, right? What the power of words and... and uh, and especially, um, uh, I'll read, uh, let's read Ecclesiastes, then I want to take you to James. Words from the mouth of a wise man are gracious, wisdom, graciousness, while the lips of a fool consume him. The fool, we said, you know, we said the fool, he makes it very obvious that he's a fool. 
One of the ways the fool makes it obvious is by what he says. Look over, uh, keep your finger there, James 3, very familiar passage. Bridle in your tongue. James has a lot to say about the tongue. I'm only going to read a little bit of it. Um, but chapter 3 is all about the tongue. So also, this is verse 5, so also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. Behold how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. The tongue is, and the tongue is a fire in the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. It's pretty strong. So he's saying, you know, so with preachers telling us in Ecclesiastes, if you want to manage risk, your words should be gracious. Your words should be wise. So you've got to manage your mouth in this crazy world here. But man, one of the key risks that you can manage is what you say and how you say it. And my wife, what do you constantly tell me? It's not, how you, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. There you go. There you go. So the wise man is gracious, is what he's saying here. Um. Now, the other thing about the fool, verse 14, yet the fool multiplies words. Even though he's got, you say it, you know, the fool is the one that doesn't know God, God, and he's trying to live without God. He's the one that's got the most words. The fool multiplies words. And no man knows what will happen, and who can tell him what will come after him. So the fool, he's got the most to say, He's usually the loudest about what's going to happen, most sure of himself about what the future is going to be, and he doesn't listen. Bad combination. Bad combination. He's got the most to say. He doesn't listen, and he's the most sure of himself about what's going to happen. Until the opposite. Until the opposite happens, okay? But look, look at verse 15. The toil of the fool. In other words, all these vain words that he's been spouting. So wearies him that he does not even know how to give, go to a city. He, doesn't know, he, he has no sense of direction. Says he doesn't even know how to get home. He doesn't even know how to get home, right? So it's, it's warning us about words. It's warning us about what we say and how we say it. And it's also given us a clue to warn us about where there's danger, right? When you have somebody with this kind of foolish behavior going on here. But the why you say it says keep the words behind your teeth. Pretty good counsel. <laughs> Pretty good counsel. Yep. Back to James. Be quick to hear. Slow to speak. Slow to speak and slow to anger. All right. So, but key to managing risk is managing what we say and how we say it. All right. Now, he's going to kind of talk about government here a little bit more. Uh, before I leave the, the words, look at verse 20. Furthermore, in your bedchamber, do not curse a king, and in your sleeping rooms, do not curse a rich man, for a bird of the heavens will carry the sound, and the winged creature will make this matter known. Can you keep secrets? Very few people can keep secrets. So wisdom is careful about what you say, particularly about authorities. Because it's very rare that conversations are kept in confidence. So that's another wise thing to do with your speech, is be careful what you're saying and who you're saying it to. All right, so we, uh, uh, let's look at leadership again, particularly foolish leadership. Start in verse 16. Woe to you, O land. I'm going to read this again. Woe to you, O land, whose king is a lad. What do we want in our leaders? Don't we want experience and wisdom? But think about a, a, a country whose king, they're being led by a child. And whose princes feast in the morning. <clears throat> What's the usual time you have a feast? 
in the evening after the work's done. Blessed are you, O land, whose king is of nobility and whose princes eat at the appropriate time for strength and not for drunkenness. Through indolence, the rafters sag, and through slackness, the house leaks. And in verse 19, man prepare a meal for enjoyment and wine makes life merry and money is the answer to everything. All right, we'll tie all this together here. One of the, one of the risks that we constantly face is bad government and, and corrupt leadership. It can happen in business, it can happen in the church, it can happen in the country or a governmental authority, right? Any, any structure, the, the leadership can become uh, foolish or corrupt here. So this is, a, you know, right? don't we see this in the news? You know, somebody's being indicted for this, some leader of a company or a preacher or, or somebody's having to leave their job because they exercised bad judgment, whatever it was. All right, so it's a constant threat. And the, the things that portray these things uh, verse 16 uh, is when you got, the, you know, I talked about foolishness juxtaposes what should be there. So usually you think of a leader as someone very experienced and very wise. Foolishness and vanity juxtaposes that. So you get young, inexperienced leaders. Um, and also they have the wrong agenda because the princes are feasting in the morning. In other words, the leaders are, instead of being out doing their job and taking care of their business, they're all about pleasure. Pleasure and, and self-absorption comes first rather than proper government. Um, this is one of the, um, keep your finger there, and flip to Isaiah 3. One of the things that Isaiah, when he was prophesying and warning uh, Judah about, he said that uh, because they had turned against God, that they were going to have um, a leadership structure that looked like this. And it's in Isaiah 3. I get my fat fingers on it here. Isaiah 3, 4 to 5. The captain of 50 and the honorable man, the counselor, uh, yeah, the counselor of 50 and the honorable man, the counselor and the expert artisan, and the skillful enchanter, he's talking about their leaders, and I will make mere lads their princes, and capricious children will rule over them, and the people will be oppressed, each one by another, and each one by his neighbor. The youth will storm against the elder, and the inferior against the honorable. Then that portray what the preacher's warning about, this juxtaposition so you get very uh, unskilled, unwise leaders. Well, this is, a, you know, right? this is a, a warning here. And it's a, right, it's a, it's, a, it's a fact of our lives, right, that the policy of the organizations that govern our society can throw a ringer in our lives. And he's warning us here of what, what this, you know, what the attributes of it are. And we have to, you know, again, like the, the hole in the ground, if this is an issue, then we need to do whatever we can to prepare ourselves for it. Blessed are you, O land, whose king is of nobility and whose princes eat at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. Uh, Solomon warned, you may, uh, that, that may ring a bell because over in uh, Proverbs 29, told you I was going to keep tying you back to Proverbs. Proverbs 29, it's warning against drunkenness, particularly for leaders. <clears throat> because they'll rule unjustly. Uh, 29, 4 to 5. The king gives stability to the land by justice, but a man who takes bribes overthrows it. A man who flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his steps. And then I didn't mark it down, but flip over to Proverbs 31. It's not, he's talking about drunkenness. It's not for kings, old Lemuel. It's not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to desire strong drink. 
lest they drink and forget what is decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. Give strong drink to him who is perishing and wine to him whose life is bitter. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his trouble no more. Open your mouth for the dumb, for the rights of all the unfortunate. Open your mouth judged righteously and defend the rights of the afflicted and the needy. That's the responsibility of leadership. So the same warning here is, is what the preacher's talking about. What in the world does verse 18 mean? Through indolence, the rafters sag, and through slackness, the house lags. You don't take care of what you've got, so ballpark. Yeah. Okay. Bad government doesn't take care of its business. And you have bridges who fail, and roads who have potholes, and those kinds of things, right? So it keeps climbing. And, and debt, uh, perhaps, yeah, yeah. So laziness destroys value and creates unpredictability. Now that can be for governments. It can be for personal people too, right? If you don't take care of your health, you're gonna get yourself in trouble. If you don't take care of your house, the rafters are gonna sag and the roof's gonna leak, right? Uh, if you don't take care of your car, right, you might get stuck somewhere or have a wreck or something, right? So he's, he's warning us here that we can't be lazy. Again, all of these are like seeing the hole in the ground, right? We know these are obvious risks, so you got to take care of them. And folly, particularly, now this is what 19, 19 I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, poke you here because I want you to think hard about this. Listen to verse 19. Men prepare a meal for enjoyment and wine makes life merry and money is the answer to everything. Okay? Now why, why is he saying this? Because what's he been telling us every week? What's the proper response of, of, of living in the fear of the Lord in this absent, absurd vain world? It's futility, but to live worshipfully now. now and take pleasure in what God's given you. And um, be content. I'm sorry? Be content. Be content. We talked last week about, uh, he, he talked about enjoying your marriage and, and you know, living, living with contentment in, in this. But what in the world does he mean by verse 19? Is he saying the same thing? Who votes that he's saying the same thing as what he's been telling us? I got one. No, I'm thinking he's talking about ones that overdo it. He's talking, yeah. It, the answer is no. Yeah. The answer is no. He's not saying enjoy it. Oh, only saying. if you see it then. <laughs> what, he, what he's talking about is foolish leadership will have wrong priorities. Foolish leadership, because look, men, men prepare a meal for enjoyment. Okay, first, first priority is uh, pleasure. Remember he said they, they eating, they're, eating in the, they're feasting in the morning, they're not feasting at night. So their priority is pleasure versus taking care of their business. Wine makes life merry. Money's the answer to everything. He's never told us that. Yeah. But what he's talking about is the priorities of an organization. That these are foolish priorities in an organization. So some of you are leaders, some of you are on boards, uh, this sort of thing, and you have influence. So he's saying that if you have the wrong priorities in that organization, you're headed for trouble, is what, what he's getting at here. Take care, like he said up in, in verse 16, take care of your business first. Verse 17, the king is of nobility and the princes eat at the appropriate time for strength and not for drunkenness. So the organization is at the top has got to have the right priorities, otherwise it's set up for trouble. So 
these things that he's given us here are indicators, right? He's, foolishness is everywhere, absurdity and vanity. He's telling us to live sensibly, which is understand there's risk in everything. Understand there's some risk you can see, there's some you can't. So he's telling us about government and organizations. These are indicators where there's risk. Wrong priorities, leaders are, are about the wrong things. Um, they're not taking care of their business. The rafters are sagging, the roof leaking. Those are all indicators of, of risk. And, and therefore, you can take whatever steps you can knowing that those are headed for trouble. So that's, that's what he's getting at here tonight. Here. So he's calling on us to live wisely, use the fear of the Lord. He, I showed you the ties back to Proverbs, and those are on, those are on purpose because he's taking God's wor word of wisdom and talking about how it applies in this <coughs> crazy, absurd, vain world here. So he's calling on us here tonight to live sensibly in the fear of the Lord and realize that risk is everywhere, right? Risk is everywhere, but we have to live with some sense about it to, to, to manage this. What risk do you face this week? Maybe in your jobs or um, other things. What, what things are you dealing with? Risk issues. Well, if you got some kind of health problem, you should get it checked out. That's okay. one of the things right there. Yeah, I called them today. So. <laughs> okay. Another story. Got some wise counsel on that one, did you? I've got to see man Friday. So. Yeah. Okay. Health issues, uh, obviously. Yeah. Okay. We risk every day when we get up yep. out of the bed. Yep. And we never know what the day holds, but we know who loves the day. That's right. So we just have to rely upon him uh, and know that he that is in us is greater than he that's in the world. Right. Yeah. And uh, live the best that we can to honor him. And we're going to have problems. I've got a tree that I have was misinformed and told to put down cell phones <laughs> by a gardener. <laughs> and my tree, I, you should see it. And But that was a risk I took, and it didn't work out. And we're not going to always at 100%. <laughs> right, right. But we have to take, we can't sit in our houses and sit in a chair yep. and not take think we won't risk, but we'll risk sitting in a chair all day somewhere in our head. Yep. So um, I think we just have to live every day as it's my last day and, and do what we think God would help us to do and we're going to all fail and we'll yeah. make mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. But if you take any kind of risk, whether it be business, health, whatever, some of them work out and some aren't. Right, right. You're already teaching next week's lesson. That's, uh -huh. that's exactly where we're going next week. So we're talking about all this risk, you know. So, so for example, we had a tree in the backyard that uh, was obviously failing. We went ahead and had the tree cut out, right? Because it could have fallen in the house, right? So that's what he's saying tonight. That's what he's saying tonight. Realize there's risk everywhere. There's risk in everything. There's different kinds of risks. Some you can see, there's some you can't. But live prudently, live sensibly, and take steps to manage these risks. That's, that's, that's honoring God in the way you live in this crazy world. Living sensibly, living wisely. And when we were in Dallas on a fun trip, we Broke my hip. Okay, I'm in a hospital there. I didn't take anything with me except overnight because we were only going to be there overnight. And uh, our life ended. I mean, it came to a real quick 
stop for both of us, because here I am in a hospital in Dallas, and Eddie's having to stay there. Our kids did bring him a car, but I mean, for how long? That was it, you know, so. So that's a good illustration. That's the snake, but that's the snake behind the wall, right? You don't know what you don't know about tomorrow, right? And, and this, you know, the illustration here is that you can have a health issue and you can be away from home and a whole bunch of things change in a hurry, right? Right? I was okay. gonna say one of the trickiest ones is risks in um, relationships or friendships. Um, you may meet someone and you go, should I take this a little farther or not? It's, it's hard to know sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they might be difficult people. <laughs> you know, someone you don't really know. Yeah. And you step into a situation. Well, well one, of, one of the things, the question is taking risk in relationship. But like he did in this chapter here tonight, he talked about how you look for warning signs. You look for warning signs. You know, you could, and we do that, right? When we have a relationship, we look for warning signs. The fool, right, it's obvious when he's walking down the road, he's a fool. He's even more obvious we saw when he opens his mouth. You look like we looked at leadership. You look at what the priorities are, right? These are all leading indicators of problems, right? So part of, part of this living sensibly is looking for the warning signs, right? That would be the way I'd apply the lesson to relationships tonight. You talked about risk. Back in the early, early days, I was an electrician. And me and a pair of us went out and worked on stuff when we were working in this hospital. And the man next to me says, yeah, the power was off there. I said, oh, okay. Instead of pulling out my meter and checking it for sure, so I grabbed that thing and pulled it out there, and I found out that it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's a good example of not being prepared. The whole, the whole I could see, right? Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've been around electricians with high voltage and stuff. Yeah. That's that's uh, sobering stuff. It's, worth <laughs> it's, it's very unforgiving. Yeah, real quick. Very unforgiving. Yeah. Any other thoughts about uh, living wisely in a risky world tonight? Okay. Well, some things to think about this week. Um, kind of what Sadie was saying, the thing that has no risk in it at all is trusting Christ as Savior. We have a faithful God who always comes through. He said, anybody that comes to me will be saved. No risk in that. But uh, beyond that, you know, so are you, are, you op are you objectively, keyword objective, evaluating the risk around you and taking appropriate actions? So I ask God to, this week in prayer, is there anything that I'm not managing sensibly? Am I putting off a health issue that I need to get checked out on? Um, <clears throat> is there a financial situation I need counsel um, on? So ask God this week, is there, is there some type of risk that I'm not managing to your honor? Um, the other big one, are you guarding your mouth? All right. Yeah, that was, that was a big source of risk. And then the obvious one is pray for our leaders for wisdom. You know, for all the reasons that we we talked about tonight. Um, so, like Sadie kind of let in, next week we're in Ecclesiastes 11, and we're going to be talking about taking risk, seizing on the opportunities that God gives us. We, we've talked about uh, through the book. He's talked about you have a lot in life. And part of that lot is to enjoy what he's given you in the moment. And another part of that lot is to seize the opportunities that he puts in front of you. So that's where we're going with Ecclesiastes 11 next week. So anything else tonight before we close? I have a joke. 
Okay. <laughs> Are we taking a risk? <laughs> it's funny. A little seven-year-old girl came up to me and she said, why doesn't Jesus wear jewelry? Because he breaks all chains. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bless God. Bless God. All right. Well, let's close tonight. Great Lord, we thank you for your word that you want the best for us and that you want to instruct us in how to live well in this crazy world. Thank you, Lord, that your ways are opposed to the vanity of this world. Help us to know them, and to follow them, and to honor you in how we manage risk and how we manage the things that are all around us. Help us to live for your glory and your honor, Lord. We give thanks for this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.